Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, September 29th, we are studying Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 to 28. The Lord gives Ezekiel two more action prophecies in order to portray to the rebellious house of Israel the coming destruction of Judah and Jerusalem and the exile for even more of the people. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, the Rev. Dr. Adam Kuntz. Dr. Kuntz serves as Assistant Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Kuntz, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, it's great to be here. So, Dr. Kuntz, you teach New Testament there at Concordia Theological Seminary, and today we get to talk Old Testament. So, looking forward to this. What, <laughs> Me too. What should we know about the prophet Ezekiel, his ministry up to this point, as we prepare to look at chapter 12? Yeah, his ministry is almost uniquely, let's say, unsuccessful by worldly measures, because he's given a message to proclaim to exiles, Um, or to those who will soon be exiles in the case of today's text. So we're looking at a guy who is given a divine mission, given divine messages over and over again, but does not have what we would think of as success. And I think that's always important to recognize, especially when you're looking at Jeremiah and Ezekiel and also some of the minor prophets, because I think that we think of prophets as experiencing a constant high of vindication. You know, I said it and look, it's happening, especially with today's prophecy where he's going to prophesy, you know, the deportation to Babylon. But the day-to-day experience of someone like Ezekiel is he receives a message over a series of years, different messages at different times pertaining to different situations. And although in the long view, and especially as you go forward in Ezekiel, you'll get to see this, But in the long view, of course, there's restoration. The Lord will build a perfect temple. Uh, The the nations will be healed. Israel will be healed. In the prophet's lifetime, there will be great suffering and hardship, especially from his own people. And prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, in terms of their lack of earthly success, I think it's it's particularly, uh, that's, that's very much for those you know, pre-exilic prophets right before the exile, because and Jeremiah had this, and it maybe is not quite as strong in Ezekiel, but there are moments where it seems like there's no hope. You know, I mean, right. that no matter how much they preach at this point, it's just not going to get through. A- right. And yet the fact that the Lord sends the prophet, even at that moment, and even with that dark of a message, I think that shows that there is, in fact, hope at the moment of Jeremiah and for Ezekiel there in exile. Yeah, because if the Lord simply were completely giving up on a people, he would not send a preacher, right? The preacher exists to call uh, sinners to repentance. And, you know, in the words of Acts, as many as were appointed unto eternal life believe, right? So the remnant is always being called out by the word of God. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I think the reason I singled them out is because of the nature of their ministries, which we see so much of as well. I mean, the historical interconnections between Ezekiel and Kings and Chronicles are numerous, right, in a way that Isaiah isn't to the same degree. But Isaiah gets a lot more press, partly because we have such a larger record of his prophecies of the Messiah and prophecies of the Messiah's work, and prophecies of the ingathering of the nations. With Ezekiel, the record is much more heavily weighted towards prophecies concerning Judah's sin, Israel's sin before that, uh, and the nature of the punishments attendant upon those things. And we tend to forget the mercy that the prophet's existence is in the midst of God's people. His very fact of being is itself divine mercy. 
I think that's going to tie in a little bit to something we're going to read in our text that we'll talk more about where the Lord says that Ezekiel is going to be a sign for the house of Israel, mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. is certainly true in terms of the, the actions that he's given to do and what those actions are intended to preach to the people, which he will explain. But, but as you said, just the fact that he's there at preaching in Babylon, that in and yeah. of itself is a sign to the people of the Lord's mercy, even as he's preaching judgment. Right. Right. Because if there were no preacher, then they would be punished in silence anyway. Uh, but there would also be no hope because there would be no word to cling to after the punishment is over. But before we read the text, we, we do encounter here in Ezekiel 12 these action prophecies again, which is is not strange to the prophets. We see other prophets do them. Ezekiel maybe has the biggest concentration of them in his ministry, and perhaps the strangest of them. Today's are oh, they're a little unusual. Maybe with this matter, he's going to dig through a wall at one point. Just in terms of, of what an action prophecy is and, and why the Lord makes use of that in his prophets, can you give us just a, an introduction to that topic before we read what's here today? Yeah, the action prophecy is there to portray vividly and arrestingly something that seemingly without such a portrayal the people wouldn't understand it's very similar in that way to the healings and the miracles that we find in the gospels right jesus's overarching purpose was not to establish what we would think of as a hospital or a place simply to heal but if you look for instance in john's gospel you understand that these healings are themselves signs of God's action among men, his his reign, his kingdom, right, in terms of the Gospels. So what you can see in the action prophecies, especially with someone like Ezekiel, in which there are several, is that this displays for the people that God is among them, and the prophet himself is among them enacting those things which God himself shall do. And there's a time delay between the action and then the explanation of the action that allows them time to pay attention, time to think, time to focus before the prophet then explains the significance of the action, right? But the action prophecy is there because there really is finally no distinction between the life of the messenger and the message that he proclaims. Let's take a look at the first action prophecy we've got here in Ezekiel chapter 12. We pick up with verse 1 of that chapter. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage, and go into exile by day in their sight." You shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. You shall bring out your baggage by day in their sight as baggage for exile, and you shall go out yourself at evening in their sight as those do who must go into exile. In their sight, dig through the wall and bring your baggage out through it. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulder and carry it out at dusk. You shall cover your face that you may not see the land, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. And I did as I was commanded. I brought out my baggage by day as baggage for exile, and in the evening I dug through the wall with my own hands. I brought out my baggage at dusk, carrying it on my shoulder in their sight. In the morning, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, What are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, This oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall lift his baggage upon his shoulder at dusk and shall go out. They shall dig through the wall to bring him out through it. He shall cover his face that he may not see the land with his eyes. And I will spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, and he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops. And I will unsheathe the sword after them. 
and they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries. But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go, and may know that I am the Lord. And that takes us through verse 16 of the text. I think we'll pause there. We've got the, the action prophecy and then the explanation of it in those verses. Dr. Kuntz, before we, before we go into that, let's start in those first couple of verses where the Lord addresses Ezekiel. And he reminds him of the people that he's living among, the people, and these are the people in exile. He calls them a rebellious house a couple times in those first verses, and then again later. Why does the Lord label his people in that way? This is a way that Ezekiel has from the very first heard from the Lord that Israel is, that they are defined by rebellion. Because when he says rebellious house, house is a way of saying family or extended family. You know, that's that's how those people are. That's how this family is. And this family of Israel is defined by its rebellion. That is, when Ezekiel speaks to them, he should not think that they have merely one or two objections, that once those are overcome, Israel will then be responsive to the Lord's word. He should expect to encounter opposition and hard-heartedness and every manner of objection to the Lord's word from the Lord's own people. So when he says that, it also pictures them not only as obstinate or you know sullen, but they are in a state of rebellion against their king. And there is something here that harkens all the way back to before there were kings in Israel. When Samuel is so disappointed in the Israelites that they have sought a king and want him to appoint one for them, the Lord clarifies for them that it is not against Samuel that Israel is in revolt. It is against the Lord. He is their true king. Right? They were supposed to be governed by his law in the way that the Babylonians were governed by Hammurabi's law, or the Roman Empire would be governed by what the emperor of Rome said. So they have been, they have been for hundreds of years in rebellion against their king. So they are a rebellious house. And I think that this is a matter of comfort for Ezekiel hmm. because he should not presume that this is going to work. He is supposed to deliver the sign and the preaching that goes with the sign, whether or not they hear, because they are, as a rebellious house, unlikely to hear. That that matter of comfort for Ezekiel ties in with the way Ezekiel received his call back in chapters 2 and 3. This is where, you know, that language of a rebellious house came up there. And the mm-hmm. Lord told Ezekiel, I'm going to make your face harder than theirs. You're, you're going to be right. even harder than them. And so, <laughs> yeah, right. the, the repeat here, I, I think, is, is perfect. It, it recalls, again, also how the Lord calls Ezekiel to be a watchman, that, that the job of the watchman is, is not really concerned with how successful he is in getting the people you know, to do whatever it is, but just to be right. faithful in proclaiming that message. And, right. and so, yeah, the, the mention of rebellious house here, I think, is is right in line with that. And I, as you were talking about, you know, a reminder of that their rebellion is ultimately against their king, who is the Lord. Yeah, I, I think there's other echoes in this text of the pre-king's days later when Ezekiel is going to be talking about a prince. I think that's a, a reminder mm-hmm. of those days. But mm-hmm. even just in the context of this rebellious house, which is repeated twice in verse 2, in the middle of it, the, the Lord tells Ezekiel, this rebellious house, they have eyes to see, but they don't, and they have ears to hear, but they don't. I think that's a an allusion to the problem of idolatry. That's where the rebellion ultimately lies, is because they, they've worshipped these gods that don't have eyes and ears. And so now the people also don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. This rebellion is, is tied, I think, closely to their idolatry. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's why you get the very same language in Isaiah which will also be picked up in the Gospels. And so I think this this sheds a lot of light on how Jesus understands the fact, which he acknowledges, that when he explains the nature of his kingdom, of God's kingdom coming in him, not all receive these things. 
right? Um, and they do not receive them because they do not desire to receive them, right? In the same sense that, you know, they in, in John, they don't want to come to the light lest their works be exposed. So there is not a problem on the end of God being open hearted with what he desires from his people, which is trust from them in him and his word. But there is a problem on the end of his people who do not desire to worship him alone. They want to have him and lots of other things. And sometimes they don't even want to have him. Right. So uh, Ezekiel should anticipate that rather than be discouraged by it wherever he finds it. So even despite this fact that they are a rebellious house who don't have the eyes to see and they don't have the ears to hear, still the Lord sends his prophet to mm-hmm. them to preach. And he has that that phrase there at the end of verse 3, you know, maybe, perhaps, they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. So even the, the Lord is holding out some hope. What is it that the Lord wants his people to understand that they don't? How, how is Ezekiel to make—well, he can't make that happen, I guess. But, but what is Ezekiel going to do in hopes of this, maybe they'll understand? Yeah, this specific prophecy, I think, he, he hopes that the people who are still in Jerusalem, and to be clear— if you go back and you read Kings and you read the end of, you know, Chronicles, Second Kings, Second Chronicles, you'll notice that uh, these deportations, which are, you know, finally called the exile or, or, you know, in Matthew 1, the deportation to Babylon. At this, all of this occurs in stages, which is why Ezekiel is going back and forth between Babylon and Jerusalem. Ezekiel himself already being resident in exile. And what he wants them to understand is this is actually going to happen. This will not be averted by, if you go and look at Second Chronicles or, or the, or the you know, Second Kings, I think probably about 24, 24 to 25, you're not going to avert this by some series of, you know, for, fortuitous, uh, you know, events that lead to your freedom. You're not going to avert this by making the right military or political alliances, because the hope that is held out by especially the ruling class of Judah, who are really the primary target, like someone like Ezekiel, who based on his Hebrew is obviously very well educated. The hope that they hold out is that somehow the doom that has been pronounced upon them for their sins will be averted by their politics or by their alliances or by their rebellion. And this is such a hope, even for this really, in the whole scheme of things, very small, very poor little kingdom, that even a righteous king, such as Josiah, dies in the midst of a battle that occurs because of his desire to make the right alliance and throw off a certain yoke. So I think that Ezekiel 12 is aimed especially at that Judahite ruling class that's still in Jerusalem and said, okay, we've seen the first you know, wave or two of exiles, but we're okay. We're going to be fine. We're going to survive. And the point of the vision in really specific context is to say, no, you're not. <laughs> because the source of your exile does not lie merely in these secondary human causes. It lies in the primary divine cause that the Lord has it against you that you do not worship him alone. He has it against you that you commit abominations in the land that he gave you. It's amazing when you start reading this part of of Israel's history, just how turbulent of a world they were living in. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, all of these these big powers around them. You have you have Assyria that then gives way to Babylon, and and they're fighting with each other. And then of course there's Egypt on the other side that kind of you know, it's always sticking its nose a little farther north to prevent any incursions. And I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a really wild time of, of history. It's really very interesting to read about. Yeah. And, and all the time when you, when you read it from, from Holy Scripture's perspective, and I love that you pointed out about King Josiah, because he even falls into it as well, it seems. It's like every king of, of Judah at this point, it's like they stick their finger up into the wind and they try to figure out, okay, which one of these big boys is going to win this time? And then <laughs> yeah. they pick a side, 
and they always pick wrong. I mean, they they just they never get it. <laughs> and and you you've got this you've got this question here that, that you sent to me ahead of time that you wanted to talk yeah. about. What are Ezekiel's yeah. politics? But yeah. I, I I think if, if and I don't I, maybe you, I'm not sure where you're going to go with that. So I'm interested to hear it. But it sounds like from what yeah. we said so far, Ezekiel. Uh, much like Isaiah before him, I recall his interaction with King Ahaz in chapter 7, Ezekiel doesn't want them to play politics. He wants yeah. them to stay out of it and trust the Lord. But but maybe yeah. that's not the direction you're going to go. So what what are Ezekiel's politics, Dr. Kuntz? Yeah, yeah. so his, his view of things is a little off kilter from, let's say, the normal framing of Judahite politics, which, like you just said, is with which much larger land-based empire will we make an alliance in our time, right? And that's going to go back and forth, and that's going to go all over the place. And those, you know, trade connections which flourish under Solomon, how can we get those going again? Maybe we could have a navy again like Solomon did. All of that is up in the air politically. And it's not that Ezekiel has no political uh, opinions but that his political opinion is focused on the nature of the Davidic throne, not on the nature of the foreign alliances. And that is because if you look at uh, specifically verse 10, calling Zedekiah, who renamed himself or was renamed Zedekiah, but before that, before he came to the throne, was named Mataniah, he was put there by Nebuchadnezzar as a replacement for Jehoiachin, his nephew, who was legitimately appointed from the Judahite dynasty. So what you can see is that Ezekiel doesn't actually believe that the man who now calls himself king, who is in Jerusalem, is actually a king, because he could have used the word for king, but instead he uses the word for prince. And so Ezekiel is saying in a very, you know, subtle way, and notice that it's inside a command, say to them. So the Lord himself does not recognize Zedekiah, formerly Mataniah, as legitimate. He is a prince, that is, he is really in charge. And so the prophecy is really addressed to him and those around him, but he's not the king. So, I mean, with with that, that Ezekiel bases his politics, if we can say it that way, on the, the yeah. true nature of the Davidic dynasty. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, so in, in that sense, the legitimate Davidic king is in exile with Ezekiel, Jehoiachin, who's yes. the—we you know, had to keep all these names straight, but he's there in exile with Ezekiel, which, I mean, from a— you know, from a certain perspective of the Davidic dynasty, seems like a problem. The, the Lord has promised David's going to have a man on the throne forever. Forever. But that yeah. guy's in, in exile. So, Correct. I mean, like, how? what is the true nature of the Davidic dynasty then? Yeah, the true nature of the Davidic dynasty is that it is completely reliant for its legitimacy on God's word. And so the question then, and this is, precisely where especially Isaiah will go, who is so rich in prophecies concerning the Davidic Messiah, everything is going to rest on whether God actually sends someone to be on that throne. And this is why I think particularly Psalms 2 and 110 are so frequently cited in the New Testament, more than almost any other passage of Old Testament scripture is not just because they are proofs that Christ is the son forever, Psalm 2, or that he inherits certain promises pertaining to Melchizedek and David, 110. It is also because everyone recognizes who is reading the Old Testament scriptures that God has made history depend not on shifting imperial fortunes, or political alliances or military victories or setbacks, he is making the entirety of the Davidic dynasty and therefore the entirety of Israel's existence dependent on whether he fulfills his word. Mm -hmm. And that that's what it all hinges on. And so when I say politics, I don't mean that Ezekiel has a particular idea about 
how they should relate to the Egyptians or the Babylonians right away or, or whatever, but that Ezekiel looks at politics from this divine point of view and says it really, nothing else really matters other than the Lord delivering on his word. Mm. Which is why then, I, I think if we can connect these dots or where we started, this is why it's so important for Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah as well, but Ezekiel here in, in exile, for him to preach that they they have to know this, that the exile is going to come, because it's, right. it is more than a matter of earthly politics, historical accident, you know, who happens to be in charge at the time, but right. this has to do with the certainty of God's word. And that's why, even though it may seem like, well, why is it so important that Ezekiel's got to preach this? That's really the point. It has to do with the yeah. certainty of God's word. Yeah, yeah, because if they don't actually believe that they're going to go into exile, then they don't really understand the things that are occurring in their in their lives, right? Uh, they they may think that you know apart from this prophecy, well, we had to go into exile because the Babylonians got upset and there were some new appointments in some of the ministries in Babylon and people unfavorable to us came into power and so this is a temporary setback. And Ezekiel wants them to be clear uh, that the reason this is happening is because of their sins that their life is not actually outside the control of the only God, because it seems that the greatest human temptation is to believe that there are parts of life outside the control of the only God, maybe all of life in the case of someone who claims to be an atheist, maybe just parts of life for most of us. And then that person believes, okay, this is my autonomous little sphere. I'm going to be fine. It all depends on me. And God wants them to understand that even what appear to be political and military setbacks are themselves divine judgments, not merely Babylonian military actions. Yeah, nothing nothing that's happening at this moment, or at this moment in Ezekiel 12, or in our moment today, is an accident. The Lord is right. in charge, and, and he would have his people believe that. We'll keep talking about that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharp Iron here on KFUO. We're talking Ezekiel 12 with Dr. Adam Kuntz. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, September 29th. We're studying Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 to 28 with Dr. Adam Kuntz. He is assistant professor of exegetical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Kuntz, prior to the break, we we read this action prophecy that Ezekiel is given. We've talked about some of the meaning of it. Let's talk just again about the ins and outs of what happens here. What is it that Ezekiel is given to do? And then how does the Lord give Ezekiel to interpret that? Yeah, he's he is given a small amount of stuff. It's called an exile's baggage. We can this is a performance and he himself is already in exile, so it's sort of a prop. Uh, that is some small amount of stuff that if you were fleeing a war, a burning city, you would take. So it's going to be some tiny amount of stuff to take with you in haste. Once he has that together, he's supposed to carve a hole in the wall out for himself, in the city wall. So cities are generally walled at this time. Um, just as a natural measure of protection and and also keeping animals in or out, depending on the system. So this is normal. There's a city wall. He has to carve a way out of it. He can't go through the gate. Uh, And that's going to be significant itself. And then once he gets out, he needs, almost like Moses with the people when he came down from the mountain shining, he needs to put a veil over his face So that the land which was given Moses to see and given to his forefathers to live in is something he can't look at anymore as he walks eastward into exile. So there are at least 
three major components there. And the meaning has to do somewhat like the Passover with haste, but also with sadness. So unlike with the Passover, there is not so much sadness for the Israelites. Here, the haste is that I need to take a small amount of stuff. It's also in the idea that I need to carve my own way out. I can't trust the city gate or the main roads to be ways that I can leave. So the major roads, the major gates, the major ways out, the normal ways out have become dangerous for some reason, maybe because they're occupied by enemy forces. So I need to escape, much like Paul trying to escape Aretas IV uh, by being let down in a basket from Damascus, right? So I'm, I'm fleeing. I am in flight. It's not just that I don't have much, but I'm in flight from whatever is behind me, right? From the pursuers. And as I flee, I wear this sign of mourning or sadness that I cannot look at the land flowing with milk and honey that was given by God. So there's something, there is great, I'll say poignancy in this image of a man who is living in terror and also living in mourning already because realize that he's not, he has to wear this thing over his face as he walks through the land. So it's, he doesn't say, it's not like Lot's wife, oh, you can't look behind you at what you're leaving. It's that as you walk through the land to get out of the land, to be exiled from the land, to be punished for your sins, don't look at what you're leaving. Extremely sad. And all those components are the things that Ezekiel is supposed to act out in front of the prince and those around him so they understand that they too are going to go into captivity. Yeah, the the matter of the uh, Psalm 137 comes to mind, the psalm that's that comes from captivity where they talk about weeping by the the rivers of Babylon. I think that that mm-hmm. same sadness ties in with this. And and even with, you know, the words that the Lord speaks in in verses 8 through 16 that he speaks through Ezekiel, especially as they apply to the prince, which I, you you had identified as Zedekiah, that I mean, just think about how Zedekiah does meet his end when it comes to you know the the historical account. He is he's quite literally blinded, and and he yep. he does not see anything as he walks to Babylon, and he does die there. A promise that that Ezekiel repeats here. One of the I mean, well, let's see a couple of things to to point out. I it's striking in verse nine that apparently what Ezekiel did got the people's attention because because they're saying what are you doing? And and the Lord says here's what you tell him, Ezekiel. So you know this idea of the action prophecy getting people's attention it it actually happens here in this text. One of the themes that comes up toward the end, uh, particularly in verse sixteen is the matter of a, a remnant. but it, yeah. And we've seen this in Ezekiel before, and it's it's been a moment of hope in several texts so far, particularly in just the yeah. previous chapter. Here, though, it's there's a slightly different spin on it. There's hope involved, the fact that there's going to be a remnant. But, but the reason the Lord says he's going to leave a, a remnant here is that as they go, they can declare all their abominations among the nations where they yeah. go. How, yeah. what, what's going on here with the remnant in verse 16? It's, it's fascinating because uh, you know that on the one hand, there will be many who will not do this uh, because they're going to leave. They can't see. They're supposed to leave actually at dusk, which is a dumb time to figure to set out on a journey, uh, certainly in the ancient world. So I can't see where I'm going and I have a cloth over my face. And so many are figured like little birds and the Lord is the hunter and he will spread his net over them and they shall be taken in his snare. But those who are not taken, those who survive, who remain, the remnant, they are not going to tell people, oh, God loves you. What they're specifically going to say is, we committed these abominations and our God was righteous when he spoke and did what he said he would do when we committed abominations. And so that declaration is a declaration of God's righteousness in punishing their sin as he said he would. And this is something that Paul takes up in Romans 1. And he's getting it from the Psalms very directly, 
but it's all over the place in the Bible, which is not only that we are justified through faith in what he promises specifically in the atoning death and justifying resurrection of his son, but that also when he fulfills what he says he will do, whether to punish sin or to deliver salvation, when he does what he says he will do, it is so that, in the words of the psalmist, you may be justified when you speak. So what will happen as the remnant goes out into the, into the nations, into exile, is that their God will be shown to be just, righteous, true, because he actually did what he said he would do. So he's mighty to accomplish what he says he will do. Of course, the flip side of that is that if he promises them salvation, he will also do that. But again, it means that the remnant will go out to the nations and proclaim what we said Ezekiel is trying to get through their thick skulls right now, which is that they have a God, the only true God, who actually makes everything depend on his word. And so that's what the remnant will be proclaiming. And a part of that message will be, we did heinous things and we were justly punished for it. I, I think the, that we, we recently, well, we studied the book of Jeremiah and then we followed that up with the book of Lamentations. And the book of Lamentations I mean, is, is like a fulfillment of what verse 12, 16 says, I think. You know, because in, in the book of Lamentations, over and over again, this is part of what's what's being spoken. Just as, as one example in Lamentations 1, verse 18, the, the text reads, The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. Now, that's, I mean, that's pretty tame in terms of, yep. you know, a confession of an abomination. But that's, right. I mean, that's precisely what Ezekiel is talking about here. And it, it's in, in the book of Lamentations, it is striking that that, that I, this is, I think, what's what maybe sounds strange to us, that the Lord lets this remnant escape so that they can go and say how awful they were, how, how many abominations <laughs> they committed. But, but I, I think you made the point well, that in so doing, that shows the Lord's complete righteousness. He, yeah. he is the, the just one. And then, yeah. of course, I mean, that's the gospel turn does come like, and I don't you, you mentioned, I think, Romans 1, but I, I think in, in Romans 3, where, where God is just and then the justifier is how that, mm-hmm. that moves to the gospel, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that he he is the one who justifies the ungodly. And my confession to someone else as I'm sharing the gospel is not, is not if I'm going to talk about myself, about, yeah. you know, the great things that I've done or something. I mean, that would just be absurd. I am not the gospel. But it is part of the gospel that God justifies the ungodly of whom I am foremost, in the words of Paul. I'll appropriate those for myself. I, I outdo Paul in being a sinner, so I am foremost, Paul. I want to dispute that with him, you know? Right. And so that's what they're going to say, is we did these things, and our God delivered on them, on what he said he would do because of them. Therefore, if he promises propitiation and atonement for sin in Christ, then that's exactly what you have. You see, the question is always, whether we're talking about political alliances or daily life or sins nobody knows about, the question is always, are you actually in charge or is God? And if God's actually in charge, then everything really does depend on his word. That's not just something the pastor says from the pulpit. Everything really does depend on his word. So you're going to want to hinge everything on him and on what he says. And so the, the proclamation of the remnant will have that effect also among the nations, that they will begin to say, wow, here is a God who, whose reign extends over this vast geographic distance. He's not limited. His temple was destroyed, but he's still somehow mighty to do what he says he will do. All of that is included in this proclamation of the remnant. And does does that, tie, I mean, it seems like then that ties in very well with what the Lord says at the end of verse 16, words that he repeats throughout Ezekiel, that yeah. through this, people will know that he's the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because his whole concern is not so much 
that, uh, you know, uh, he's nervous that people, you know, see that he's a smart guy or something, the sort of anxieties that we have when our word or, or our actions are in question. He doesn't need anything, you know. Uh, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. He doesn't need anything. The point is so that his people, first of all, the Jew first, and then also the Greek or the Babylonian or the Persian, shall know who he is, that he is the true God, and that he speaks truly. And and that is seen in his judgment, as we're getting it in Ezekiel 12, and in his salvation in, in other texts. Here it's judgment, but those right. two things do go go hand in hand. Let's let's pick up the rest of the chapter. We're, we're starting again mm-hmm. in Ezekiel 12, now verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking, and drink water with trembling and with anxiety. And say to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel, They shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink water in dismay. In this way her land will be stripped of all it contains on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it. And the inhabited cities shall be laid waste, and the land shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel, saying, The days grow long, and every vision comes to nothing? Tell them therefore, Thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, The days are near, and the fulfillment of every vision. For there shall be no more any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak the word that I will speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, but in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, None of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. That's the rest of our text for today. That was Ezekiel 12, verses 17 to 28. So, Dr. Kuntz, in in verses 17 through 20, you have another, I think, action prophecy, or I suppose it could be a little more, more general, but it sounds like an action prophecy about how Ezekiel is to eat and to drink. We've seen the Lord do things with his diet in the past. This is a little more tame than what he was told to do back in <laughs> chapter four. Yes, uh, but, it is. But it's, but it's still, so it's still an important action prophecy. What's, what's being communicated in the way that Ezekiel is to eat and drink here? They need to understand that even the basic things of life, bread and water, are not places of refuge anymore because the land itself is beginning to spew them out. And there's language that really echoes the description of the earth before the flood. That is that on account of, this is in verse 19, on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it. Uh, That notion that they have filled uh, the entire land given them by God, as man did before the flood, with violence, with what is unnatural and forced and nasty and ungodly, unrighteous. So in view of that, Ezekiel is supposed to show them that even their most basic daily functions of nutrition are things that they can't take for granted anymore because they are on the verge, and that's where he's going to go next, they are on the verge of radical change. And it's interesting to note that the Bible doesn't think about depopulation, that is, the land being desolate, the cities being emptied, depopulation is always a divine judgment. It's never a good thing, right? So the cities and the land are going to be empty. Things will be overgrown. It will become, you know, the haunt of jackals as a result of divine judgment upon sin. Everything will be emptied, and they need to know that that's going to happen soon. Yeah, that that language, the way that you connected the the violence there to the pre-flood, I mean, I just, this is something that I, I think we often, in our minds, tend to focus on the violence, those, the crimes against, or that are moral crimes, 
Ezekiel, yeah. but I mean, I just love how the scriptures do this, and Ezekiel does it here. He he's got the idolatry in view already, and now notice the violence that comes out of that, and it just I mean, right. total wickedness, especially when you connect it to what happened before the flood. And I think sometimes right. we separate those things in our own minds that we we're so attuned to maybe the violence and all of the immorality we see about that. But we sometimes forget the idolatry that goes hand in hand with it. And I right. just to see yeah. Ezekiel and, and all the you know, the prophets and the apostles, they all do this. But the way they connect it, I think, is something for us to to definitely keep in mind as we see immorality growing. We need to know idolatries behind it. Right. Right. Yeah, because the commandments are not divorced from each other in their keeping, and so they're also not divorced from one another in their breaking. So as the text continues, then that that action prophecy again fairly fairly simple in, in what's being said yeah. there. He he maybe there's a bit of a shift here in verse twenty one that has to do with this sounds like some of the reaction that Ezekiel was getting toward his ministry at yeah. large, and and this is one of those places and, and we see this regularly in the the prophets and apostles both where you get the the opponent's sermon or the opponent's slogans that are getting thrown yeah, out. Slogans. So, so the, the first one, what, what's this first one? The days grow long and every vision comes to nothing. What's the, the slogan that's being thrown at Ezekiel there? Yeah, they're, they're saying, you know, look, like when, when did this happen? And what's so interesting about the arrogance of that slogan is that it has happened. It happened to the Northern kingdom and they did not heed that. And many things have already come to pass in the southern kingdom, but because it doesn't personally affect them, those who are still in Jerusalem, they say, this isn't going to happen, you know? And it's a lot like, you know, the slogan that you get in Second Peter, all things continue as they have from the beginning of creation. There's always this comforting delusion that people really enjoy having which is that other people will be punished for their sins. I and those I love will not be. I just, why would that happen? And so there is, there, there are these slogans very similar to the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord in Jeremiah, that these slogans comfort people. And so they pop up over and over again, similar to, when the Pharisees are breaking the commandments, they've taught themselves and their proselytes to say, this is Korban, you know, uh, this is given to God. So mom and dad, I, I can't help them out because I already gave this stuff to God. So the slogan functions here as a substitute for thought, but the slogan also functions as an explanation you can keep giving yourself as to why this guy whose message you really don't like really is wrong. And so what Ezekiel is supposed to do is to give them a sense of urgency that they don't have and to say, look, time is up. (laughs) You know, this is over now and uh, this is going to happen. And it's a it's a it's a tone of urgency that you find in the New Testament with the gospel. You know, why are they traveling as widely as they are? Why does Paul appeal and say, you know, to the Corinthians, my heart is wide open to you. Be reconciled to God. Now is the day of salvation. This tone of urgency comes about because you say, look, God is dealing with us in this specific way, right? Uh, Since the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's specifically through repentance and faith in Christ, right? Like very, very, very clearly, that's why we're going. That's why we're announcing that's why we are urging men to be reconciled to God. And that urgency is the very thing that the people listening to Ezekiel lack. Mm. Well, and, and the lack of urgency then just allows, or they use it to put off the prophet's message because it, yep, it's not exactly. happening now. It's not happening in my day, and it's probably not going to happen. So I don't have to listen. And I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's striking too that that it doesn't, I mean, this attitude is certainly present among the people who are still in Jerusalem, yep. but it also seems to be present among the people who are already in exile. I mean, you know, Jeremiah wrote that letter to the exiles that we get in 29 of his book, and he warns them of the false prophets who are there, that that apparently there's this, this attitude among the exiles already that, you know, they think it's going to be short, they're going to be going home soon, everything's going to be okay. And, and, and I mean, that, that sort of arrogance is even 
I mean, just to add the cherry on top, I suppose, that you, you're you in exile and you still think that these things are not going to happen. And and the Lord says through Ezekiel, no, it, I mean, and I think this is the, the way the Lord turns the slogan on its head, essentially, and says, no, you think it's far off. It's it's here right now. Repent yeah. today. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's really sick when you see it in practice. I mean, yeah. you see this with Hezekiah. He's told everything that is here will be taken and it will be taken to Babylon. And some of the men who come from your body, some of your sons, your descendants, they will become eunuchs and they will be taken away too. And, but this won't happen in your lifetime. So Hezekiah says, okay, good. You know, there, there is a horrible selfishness and a normalcy bias that, that human beings have that causes them to think that even urgent divine messages and horrible divine messages just are not that big a deal because it, I'm not going to live to see it. And it causes just horrible irresponsibility and callousness. But even a, a king as generally good as Hezekiah can fall into that. A lot of this language reminds me very much of the way Jesus speaks in in his eschatological discourses, in times discourse in the Gospels, where yeah. just the urgency that's there, and the I mean, if if this is the case that when the Lord speaks, it's going to happen, and there's not going to be a delay, even though you don't know, I guess, the precise when, because He has right. said it that way. The only response is to do what Jesus says, which is to to watch, be ready. Right. right. Yeah, and and. It, it there could be any number of reasons, you know, why that's happening. What distractions do they have? And it seems from the discussions of, you know, punishment and and what will be taken away from the city that this is gonna, you know, your your version of distraction is gonna vary by are you a man or a woman? Are you young or old? You know, uh, Hezekiah is old enough that he knows he's not gonna live to see the punishment. But that callousness toward other human beings is an index of a callousness toward God's word that gets exhibited over and over and over again. And the really sad thing about it is that just because you don't feel the urgency doesn't mean that the situation is not critical. Dr. Kuntz, we have about three minutes left on the morning. We talked through several things here in Ezekiel 12. Despite that you know, strong gospel emphasis that we got toward the end of Ezekiel 11, how the prophets really turned back to, to a lot more language of the law, words of condemnation and warning. As, as we think through this chapter and everything Ezekiel does and says, help us to summarize it, and, and how does a, a text like this point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the summary is, is quite simply that especially those who are well to do in this world, who have much and have much to lose, will likely be the very last people to listen to any preaching that says that all flesh is like grass. On the other hand, we know that the Lord intends through whatever troubles we go through or whatever occurs in our time, in our land, our place, that the Lord will preserve for himself in words he uses elsewhere to comfort a different prophet, 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, whose life is not defined by idolatry with all its fruits. That's a great comfort. That's also especially a comfort for preachers who spend a lot of time preaching to rebellious houses, that even out of rebellious houses, the Lord will keep for himself a remnant who will be saved you know, plucked like a brand from the burning. This points us to Christ, especially in these beautiful words where he says, the word that I speak will be performed and I will speak the word that I will speak and it will be performed because that cuts both ways. That applies obviously for judgment. So I can't escape the Lord's judgment, but it also means that when, you know, Paul says that in Christ, all the promises of God find their yes and their amen, that that is just as reliable as his judgments. So if his judgments are sure, so too are his promises. And I think that this is the ultimate purpose of all of Holy Scripture, that we may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent. And one way to overcome the hardness of our hearts and the idolatry that is native to sinners 
is to continually hear this message that he is true and just and he will accomplish what he intends. And that includes in Jesus Christ, the salvation of sinners. So just as surely as apart from Christ, I can rely on his righteous judgment. So to in Christ, I can rely on the fact that Christ has borne his righteous judgment in my stead and has been raised from the dead for my justification. So in both his judgments and his promises, he is shown to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz is Assistant Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, helping us today with Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 to 28. Dr. Kuntz, thanks for being our guest today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Ezekiel, comments on the series, we'd love to hear from you. Send an email to kfuo. at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.